Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. The Engineering Council for Diversity and Inclusion welcomes you to our final episode of Walking the Walk Together panel series with the theme of growth as people start joining us. I just want to introduce and, and give everyone a chance to reflect on what this panel is all about. Um, it's been led by numerous students uh, at SCU from June until now, and it really has kind of evolved with the the racial justice movement that has occurred that started in June, but you know started way before then, um, and really has con continued consistently reflecting on everything that has happened since, including the election and including last week's insurrection. Um, our hope is that these panels start conversations educate allyship and bring together all cultures and diversities to turn words into actionable steps to, and to help move our community forward in a positive way. We hope we can create a constructive atmosphere that nurtures ideas and real solutions for the real issues that we are discussing. Thanks for introducing us, Danny. And hi everyone, I'm Sarah, um, and I'm just here to let y'all know about some house rules. Um, so for our Santa Clara students watching live on Zoom, please keep your video and microphone off during this portion. But if you have any questions, the chat room is open and we'd like to invite you to use it if you have any questions throughout the event. Um, if your question isn't addressed during the first hour, there's going to be another chance to ask our panel's questions during the second hour in our non-recorded breakout rooms for which students will be randomly assigned. And for our faculty, staff, and audience watching their live stream across the world, there's a Google form on our webpage for you to submit any questions throughout the event as well. Um, and if you're in an ELSJ class and watching this for credit for that, you may log this event as Arupe Engagement Hours and the Arupe team will be hosting peer-led 30-minute reflection spaces on what anti-racism means in the context of your community placements. And the times and Zoom links for those will be in their Arupe newsletter. Um, also, just as a note, in support and collaboration with ASG, we'll be ending our second hour at 7.45 to allow Father O'Brien to speak during the second half of their important meeting. So if you want to watch any of the past panels and hear from panelists like Ellen Ochoa, the first Hispanic Latinx astronaut, you can find the recordings at scu.edu slash engineering slash WTWT. And before we continue on, I want to shout out all the students that have worked on this before. You know, it's not just me and Sarah. Um, it's, there's been a whole lot of other moderators and people, you know, looking at the questions, figuring out what needs to be done for these panels. So I really want to shout out those other students as well. Um, you know, and then also everyone for making it through this, these first few virtual quarters. As Ricky likes to mention, we are all first generation virtual learners. So that is really an accomplishment for everybody. You have earned your spot wherever you are and you deserve to be here and you belong. And then before I forget, I need to introduce myself. I'm Danny Mendoza. You can call me Daniel, Danny, Dan, whatever you prefer. Um, and I'm a senior from Thousand Oaks, California. I'm studying electrical engineering with a minor in sustainability. And I'm one of the two co-presidents of the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers or SHIP for short. And our other co-president, Sarah, will also be introducing herself. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Lopez, and I'm also a senior from Cupertino, California. I'm studying computer science and minoring in music and in math, and I'm the other co-president of SHIP. All right. So just to emphasize for everybody, please feel free to throw any questions that you have in the chat, and we'll get to as many as we can. And now it's time to introduce our guest panelists. So panelists, as we say your name, uh, it'd be great if you could also take a little minute to tell the audience a little bit about who you are. Um, so let's start with our panelist, Lisa Kloppenberg. Thank you very much, Sarah. Happy New Year, everybody. It's such an honor to be here. I've tried to catch as many of these walking the walk together as I can. I've been so impressed with the work of our student organizers and grateful to Director Padilla and the School of Engineering too for hosting this. I think it's a really great forum, especially when we can't be together physically. 
It's a really nice opportunity. So thank you very much. So I am the provost and Sarah, I don't know if you want us to do really short introductions now, or if we should go into a little more, some of the questions you asked about you know, why we're at Santa Clara and why we do the work we do. Well, let's do a short intro and then that'll be the first question that we ask. That's great. So uh, Lisa Kloppenberg, Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs. So basically I supervise all of the deans and student life and all of the things that contribute to your academic and co-curricular success at SCU. Thank you for introducing yourself, Lisa. Next up, we have Eva Blanco Macias. Mm. Hi, everyone. I'm Eva. Uh, I am currently Vice President for Enrollment Management. Um, I'm into my seven month into that role. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, Dean of Admissions, and I've been at Santa Clara for about 18 years. For me, uh, Enrollment Admissions is actually a second career. I started in uh, Latino media and um, wanted to pivot at a time when I wanted to do work that uh, um, I thought was uh, meaningful. And for me, my college education uh, journey was, was, uh, was, was pivotal. And so um, I've enjoyed being at Santa Clara. For me, the mission is, has uh, really centered my work. And um, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here um, and to see all of you. And uh, Ricky, uh, thank you too for all your support uh, to this program. And all the work you've done uh, during the time you've been at Santa Clara. We've been a great ally, certainly to enrollment and admission. So um, happy to be here tonight. Thank you, Eva. And next up, we have Father Kevin O'Brien. Uh, hi there, Kevin O'Brien. I'm president of Santa Clara University. Uh, I've been in this role uh, about a year and a half. So I've been more serving as president in COVID than before. I was just in office for just a few months before the pandemic. And that, I just really wanna start, I just wanna uh, acknowledge to our students um, the, the, what this last year has been like for you. And I, I admire what you're doing, how you transitioned your, your courage, but also acknowledge the, the challenge that, that you faced. And uh, um, I'm just so grateful to be with you at Santa Clara. Before becoming president, I served as Dean of our Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley. And before that, I served um, a decade in Washington at Georgetown University. Thank you, Father Brian. And finally, it's my pleasure to introduce Aaron Kamara Walsh. Hi, thank you so much for having me tonight. Uh, my name is Erin Kimura Walsh. I'm the director of the Lead Scholars Program, which supports our first generation college students at Santa Clara University. Um, I've been in this position overseeing the program kind of in various titles uh, for the past 11 years. Um, I'm also a Santa Clara University alum, so I graduated class of 1998, a little while ago, um, and I'm zooming in from Redwood City, California, so about a half hour north of campus um, and at home uh, living here with my husband, who I met in Swig Hall, which is one of our residence halls on campus. Um, he and I are both alumni, um, and we have a couple daughters uh, who, are, who are with us as well, a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old um, who are doing Zoom, Zoom classes, so a lot of family time um, together <laughs> for the past year or so, almost a year year now. So it's great to be here tonight with all of you. And, you know, just to echo, you know, what Father O'Brien said, you know, just, you know, want to acknowledge how challenging, you know, this time has been for all of us and especially our students. Um, and, you know, just just happy to be here, you know, and, and have this, you know, and get to share in community with you and conversation with you tonight. Great. Thanks, Aaron. And thank you, everybody. Before we get started, um, let's do like a super quick breathing exercise to release any nervousness or tension. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll lead the pacing, but um, we'll take 10 deep breaths together. So in, out, in, out, in, that's three, four, in, out. Five, in, out, six, in, out, seven, 
in, out, eight, out, nine, in, out. And I think that's 10 if I did my math correctly. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and dive in. So panelists, you don't have to answer every question or any question that you are not comfortable with. Uh, so let's just, so just go ahead and jump in wherever you have something to add. Um, we don't have to follow a specific flow of questions. So please, if any other panelists or Sarah or I mentioned something of interest of you, please, please, please feel free to jump in and say what you have to say. Um, but yeah, we're gonna start with a very general question. Um, the one Lisa, you had been asking for. <laughs> What is your why? Uh, what, why are you in the position you're in? Why did you want to be in that position? And how has your life and background helped you in your position? Anyone go ahead. Thank you. I guess I'll jump in, uh, Danny. So, um, you know, I'm at Santa Clara because of the Jesuit mission that really resonates with me. This idea that we are together trying to create a more just, an equitable world. So, um, you know, this series is part of that. And so um, I'm really, that's kind of what motivates me to be here. I'm in higher education because I really believe, as Eva said, that education is such a, a big part of equity in our society. Opportunity for people trying to create a, a more fair playing field. So my mom um, was born to immigrants and she had to leave school after eighth grade because there were seven kids in the family and she was the oldest girl. So she had to help support the family. Um, and one of my grandparents is from San Salvador. So that for me, that the, all the issues around immigration and access and equity are really critical. So um, I'm not technically first generation under Aaron's definition, but I certainly you know, have this great belief that our democracy is not gonna function well unless it's inclusive and welcoming of all, including our international students, right? And our refugees and all. So that kind of drew me to law. Um, and then I was Dean of our law school for uh, six and a half years before I became interim provost. And then about March, I became provost right before, unfortunately we had this uh, kind of closed down campus. So that's a, a little bit get started on kind of what really matters to me and why I do the work I do. I'll jump in. Um, so a little bit about um, me and my background. Um, I'm uh, one of uh, six kids. My my parents are from Mexico, from uh, Guadalajara, or uh, close to Guadalajara, the city of Jalisco. Um, and uh, both my parents... Uh, our, our orphans were orphans, um, and uh, my father was a bracero, so he worked um, in uh, uh, farming and a number of industries, um, had one year of elementary school, and my mother, uh, also an orphan, uh, had four years of elementary school, and um, life wasn't, uh, wasn't easy, um, and we lived, uh, in the end, we ended up, my parents ended up immigrating, and we ended up in Los Angeles. I'm originally from uh, Venice, uh, which is a very different town than when I was growing up. Um, but uh, it was, I was always aware of the fact that I was, um, first of all, Mexican, that there was this difference in treatment. And um, I saw my parents work really hard. And so for me, um, you know, pretty early on, I was, I was thrusted to, uh, to help, to support uh, to translate for my parents. And uh, so I built, a, and, and, and also a deep faith. My father, my parents were, uh, depended a lot on their faith to do good, but there was always that kind of mission. Um, my parents always uh, promoted education. Um, they, in fact, I, I always remember my father quoting saying, you know, le doy gracias a Dios que ustedes tienen una educación para que no pasen las miserias que, que, que experimentamos nosotros, which means that um, you know, I thank God that uh, you all have an education and that way you don't have to experience um, the misery and the hardship that, that we've had to endure. Um, and so I carry that with me. Um, I, um, uh, 
had always, you know, pressed on to do well in school, to try to get to college, not necessarily knowing where I was going to end up. Um, ultimately, I ended up at Yale, uh, not necessarily by, by design. Uh, it was a little accidental. Um, and my experience while I was there um, was, was love-hate. Um, there's some great things about it. And there were some experiences that were really challenging. I think every single year I used to say, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to transfer. <laughs> I got to go home, you know, whether it was that first snowfall that I was just, you know, miserable under um, or just, you know, an experience, somebody saying something or not always feeling, you know, included that perhaps it'd be better at another place. In retrospect, I feel like it was the best decision I could have made um, because I learned a lot, not just certainly from, you know, being in the classroom, um, but uh, I learned a lot about my, my, myself, about uh, being resilient, but I, I also learned how important it is to have people like me in places like Yale, like Santa Clara, like all institutions, because we were few. At the time when I was attending university, uh, I believe we were about 7% of the entire population. And um, I distinctly remember having conversations and debates and being invited, you know, being part of panels and classrooms and being invited home to the homes of my my roommates who, you know, one, one parent was, um, you know, law professor at Columbia Law School. Another one was Supreme Court Justice in New York. And we'd have conversations about cases that they were dealing with where um, I had something to say. So I recognized very early that, uh, you know, educational institutions need diversity um, because from there, everyone will leave doing something in their life and they will carry with them what they know and what they've experienced and what they've learned. And some of that learning has to come from personal engagement, interaction, dialogue, discourse, and that happens at places like Santa Clara. Um, so when I left Yale um, at the time, I thought, you know, well, what do I want to do? Um, and I first thought, you know, entertainment. And the reason for that was because I thought, again, it was important to um, uh, have representation in the media industry. And that was close to home. You know, I grew up in Los Angeles. Um, and to also the representation of our stories, right? Our stories, um, both talent in front of the cameras, behind the cameras. And, and so I had that, that, that was my motivation. Um, I, I had a, a good career and that actually then took me to Miami and I lived in Florida for a few years, but I did feel a little bit off course for a while. And, and, and I left Miami because at the time there was a big launch industry into Latin America. And so I did quite a bit of work there, um, but I wanted to be more intentional about making a difference. And that's when I also realized I do better in California weather <laughs> and wanted to come home um, where my family was close, where I could have, you know, tortillas all night, you know, anytime I wanted to. Um, but also, um, you know, I, I think the issues and the concerns and the culture, right, the arts and and the language, that, that all was important to me. And I wanted to come back to California and I landed here in the Bay Area um, and decided to pivot and uh, probably did it at the worst time. Um, because it was right in the middle of the internet bust. Uh, but uh, I applied to Santa Clara um, and uh, because I wanted to get into education, um, I didn't get that first, uh, I applied for a first position and they said no. So I thought, okay, well, I'll go back to doing what I do. Um, and a few weeks later, they called me back and they said, you know, we have another position that we think might be a better fit. Um, and I started off doing uh, recruitment uh, for transfer students. And I've been here ever since. I think it's been, for me, um, I've, I've grown a lot. Um, I was able to certainly to parlay what I had gained um, from college, from, you know, my, my, my first career to then, um, you know, to now then playing the role that I do. And, and it's been a growth process. And um, now that I'm here in this role, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I think at the same time, you know, there's obviously, I think with everyone, a lot of uncertainty about the future, but I, I see, um, you know, the, that Santa Clara um, is looking ahead, um, that we are trying to become an anti-racist campus, uh, that we are gaining or wanting to become more diverse. I think that's an imperative. I think when I look certainly from the demographics, um, California and certainly the country is, is more diverse, is becoming more diverse. And so if we're about an institution that's to educate um, for the transformation, improving the lives, that's, 
that's that's all of us. That's communities of, of various walks of life. And so I find that to be an exciting moment. Obviously, I think uh, we know that there's a, ch- a lot of challenges ahead. Um, but um, I've also learned that I'm up for it. Um, and, uh, and, and so that's, that's why I do what I do. Um, and uh, happy to continue the conversation. Should I go ahead then? I guess I'll go. Um, so let's see. So I guess, you know, when I look way back, so I'm originally from Seattle, Washington, um, and, uh, grew, you know, grew up there. Um, and I, you know, I look back, I, I had a real, I guess, a, a, a wonderful um, K through 12 experience um, at the public, in the public high school system um, in Seattle. And I had a very diverse um, friend group. Um, especially in elementary school. Um, most of my friends were African American. Um, and, you know, and, you know, we continued on together, um, you know, through our K through 12 experience, but I saw them less and less in my classes. Um, and at the time, I didn't really understand what that was, what, what this experience was, I just knew that they weren't in my classes anymore. Um, and, you know, as I look back, right, you, you know, I, I now see, oh, that that was tracking. Right. That was this assessment of children based on, you know, their income level, based on the color of their skin, based on, you know, perceptions about their their potential and, and, and you know, and their academic ability. And, you know, and they were tracked out of the classes I, that I that I was um, that I was in. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, that experience, you know, my experience with with such a diverse friend group was such a gift. Right. I think it gave me all of these kind of skills to engage with, um, understand the perspective of just, you know, the, you know, so many people who are, who are out in the world, right. And, and the many different backgrounds um, that people have. Um, and I think it also gave me this really, you know, um, intimate understanding, right. Of, of um, the, um, um, you know, the, the ways in which racism affect us, right. Um, and the cost that it had for for those friends, and you know, and for myself, right? That that we all lose out when we're living in segregated spaces, um, and you know, so you know, that was you know, I think that really shaped, of course, who I am. Coming to Santa Clara University, I was involved. So I was an English major, um, and I was also um, a Japanese language and literature major. But really, it was the co curricular activities. So all of you who are involved in clubs and leadership activities, that's where I found my passion. I was involved in CSI. Um, I was facil- facilitating diversity workshops um, as a student and realized that's what I love to do. Um, and so from there, um, you know, wanted, realized I wanted to work um, in, you know, student affairs, um, student support um, at a college or university and did uh, um, a master's in college counseling at San Francisco State, um, came back, helped found the LEAD Scholars Program in the early 2000s while I was working here as a new professional. Um, and then um, did a PhD at UCLA and, you know, had the good fortune of Laura Fujieta, who's now the, the head of our drama center, um, gave me a call and said, hey, you know, the person who was running lead left, you know, do you want to apply? Um, and so, um, you know, was able to, to come back and, and, um, and oversee the lead scholars program. Um, you know, you know, I, I do the work because of the students. Right. I mean, they are such a gift, like every day that I get, you know, that I have the honor of like just walking with them um, in their journey, the gift, you know, of seeing them come back from study abroad, just confident, walking more, you know, just walking taller, just, you know, you know, the, 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 yeah, the confidence, the, the knowledge they gain, the understanding about who they are and what they can contribute to the world. Um, you know, that's, that's why, you know, that's why I, I wake up every morning, right, and do what I do every morning, um, because they are such an inspiration to me, um, and, and just phenomenal people. Um, so that's why I do what I do. I, I feel like we should just sort of be silent and reverence the stories that were shared, because, uh, you know, I guess why am I at Santa Clara? Because of the people that you've just heard from, right? Uh, great people who are deeply committed to a mission greater than ourselves. Uh, particularly for me, you know, why am I here? I'm a Jesuit. And um, as a Jesuit deeply committed to 
educating for justice and a faith that does justice, I believe very strongly, as Lisa indicated, the transformative power of higher education, particularly one rooted in a, in a mission that's age old, right? So a, a mission which is deeply ingrained in the humanities and liberal arts, yet can find expression in the professions and different walks of life as new disciplines emerge, but which has you know, consistent values, some of which have been mentioned, you know, diversity and inclusion or, or building a sense of belonging. Um, uh, the faith that does justice, right? Uh, intercultural, interreligious dialogue, care for each person in mind, body, and spirit. That's a, a way of proceeding which has served us well for uh, nearly 500 years. So I believe, and I'm I'm a product of it. I went to, I, I was born in Montreal, um, but moved to Florida with my family where my dad's work uh, took us. Uh, my brother and sister and I, my, my parents never, they both completed high school, never went to college, but they wanted all of us to, um, uh, to go to college. So they sent us all to uh, different Catholic universities. I, I ended up at Georgetown where I met the Jesuits for the first time. Now it took, it took a while for them to sort of, to really capture my heart and mind. I was a bit resistant. I uh, went to law school, figuring I'd have a career in politics. Cause again, I wanted to serve but I realized that that was not going to be the way to serve for me. It just, I think politics is, is a noble profession and we need more people in public service. And the last week has shown that. Um, we, need, we need good people like those that Santa Clara graduates. And, and we proudly had some real leaders, uh, alumni from Santa Clara on the Hill last week. Um, so I, I, I went, I left my law practice to teach high school just to figure out my life. And it was there that I really found my calling as an educator. And that's when I sort of figured out my vocation or calling as to the Jesuits. And I spent 10 years in Jesuit training, picking up a bunch of different degrees, philosophy and theology. But we also did a lot of work along the way. Jesuits, we work, we study, we work, we study, we pray, we pray, we work, we study. We try to do all those things. Probably one of the most significant types of work I did, I worked in inner city parishes, I worked in universities, but probably one of the most significant types of work for me was with the Jesuit Refugee Service, working in immigration detention centers in Los Angeles and on the border of Arizona and, and uh, Mexico. Um, and I think for there, it just made the face of immigration to me come alive in a very different way. My immigration story came from the North the immigration stories that come from the South and to our West are very, very different. And uh, there I began a heartfelt conviction and passion to advocate on behalf of migrants and refugees and displaced persons. So I continued my work with JRS even after I was ordained doing different things, including bringing students to the border, bringing faculty to East Africa, to the refugee camp there. Um, so it just as part of who I am, and it's grounded me not just as a Jesuit, but as a human being. I spent 10 years uh, in Washington. I met much of that time at Georgetown in different roles. I uh, just want to highlight one role, uh, and I'll conclude my remarks, because it, it says something about what I'd like to do here at Santa Clara, or why, why I'm still here. And that is, uh, I, I was on this working group to examine and study and, and really address the history of slaveholding by the Jesuits in the Eastern colonies and then later United States. The Jesuits landed in the United States from the colonies in 1634. And in the 18th century, because of the land we held, we, uh, we, we, we owned enslaved persons. And so for about 60 years, Jesuits were involved in, in slaveholding. Um, and uh, that history was not secret. That was something that we reckoned with for decades at Georgetown, but it took on a very different meaning in the light of the racial justice movements following the killings of Michael Brown and, and others and the, and the killings in Charleston. And that, uh, as, this, as the, the, the movements for racial justice quickened uh, in, the night, in 2014 and 15, the, the conversation about our history was deepened. And what that taught me a lot about was the need for truth telling and justice making sort of as paired and uh, a deep commitment to restorative justice. 
And one of the commitments that Lisa and I are making, or we've said publicly, is to try to make restorative justice a way of proceeding on the Santa Clara campus. We already do some of that in student life and in, in the student conduct process. But I, I, it, this actually, this approach to relationships, to dealing with wrongs or hurts, to ruptures of relationships, restorative justice is a practice that is steeped in the Catholic tradition, but also secular traditions that can be a way of proceeding about how we relate to one another that doesn't just simply redress wrongs, but restores relationships and uh, brings more people into a conversation of, of truth telling, of healing, and at, apropos to tonight's topic, to growth. So I just, I wanna end there because I, we are quickly running out of time. So um, thanks, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, great. Thank you for everyone for your remarks. You know, <laughs> that gives everyone a chance to really get to know everyone on a, on a personal level and understand where everyone has come from and what is on everyone's mind. So uh, going off that, this this question is really is aimed at uh, Father O'Brien, Eva, and Lisa, who, you know, many of you have been at the university for several years, but I believe uh, this is the first year for, for many of you in your current role. Um, what have you learned over the over the past year? You know, what have been some of the highs and lows of that most recent year? I don't always want to go first. Eva or Kevin, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, well, um, where do I start? Um, I'll I'll just pick a few. I mean, one. You know, honestly, I think as I look back as to where we are and, uh, um, you know, where we started, certainly when, when we went into sheltering in place, because that moment in time went pretty hand in hand with my coming into this position, to be quite honest. Um, so, it, it, you know, I, I, I think I, I, I'm pretty, I'm really proud about where we've come. And certainly when I think about my team, the enrollment management team, and that's everyone in admissions, financial aid, and the one-stop enrollment center, because we're at a time where we're about to open up the campus and invite the next uh, group of students to come take a look, and we very quickly had to shift. And so there's just an incredible amount of resiliency, of, of teamwork, of commitment to what we were doing um, at that moment in time. And I, and I think that we then we're able to transition um, really beautifully. That doesn't mean that it didn't come with its hardship and its challenges as we all were, you know, grappling with the realities and our different family situations. And, and, you know, seeing what was happening in our communities with our students who then in the end couldn't make it to Santa Clara for a number of different reasons. Um, and so I think it, what I learned was just how even more important it is to, you know, double down on the work that we do and the and the mission and not to mention then looking ahead as to what this all the crises that have we've endured that you know uh, continue to manifest themselves in a number of different ways um, there's more work to be done and um, you know I, I as I process that I think that um, you know it, it, it creates a, a, a pretty uh, pivotal moment for us even in an institution because, you know, the history of institutions is, is to just transform students, but, but for the uh, betterment of society, of our world. And so here's this crisis that has left our world very different. Um, and uh, so that's both exciting, it's, it's scary, and, and I don't have the answers, but um, I think that uh, I, I feel like I'm in good company. And uh, I think it's, it's revealed a lot of just this, the strength that people in our community at Santa Clara have the commitment, the friendships, um, and the bond and, and the will to, to, to move forward, um, despite, you know, again, the challenges and, and because it has been difficult. Um, I don't think, uh, had somebody asked me that, you know, you're going to experience this and, and uh, still be standing, I don't know if I would have believed that. But um, again, I have found a lot of strength in the community. Um, and so I think um, that that has been um, it, it renews and restores, um, again, both my commitment and, and my energy to keep moving ahead. It's actually, it's a really great question um, because I think we all need some distance from this in order to really fully appreciate, you know, what have we learned? How have we grown? 
because we're still in the midst of, of it, both the pandemic and for me, the last year, my first year and a half, really, the, you know, the twin pandemics, right, of the COVID and of racism, both are, you know, I'm living through, we're all living through both of those together, and there's certainly overlaps in the impacts. Um, so in one sense, so close to it that, you know, in Jesuit spirituality, it's very important to be attentive to what we call the interior movements of the soul, which are basically all the stuff that happens inside of us, the, the desires, the reactions, the feelings, the emotions, the strong insights, all that stuff in our interior landscape. And I, I'm, I try to carefully discern like th- th- these, the impact of what I'm experiencing on the outside. And there are moments of such deep um, sadness and loss, anger, frustration, which I'm, all of us can relate to in different ways. But I also have to say, I've been amazed at moments when I've allowed myself to feel them of great hope and confidence. And the confidence comes, the confidence comes from the people that I'm with. I mean, folks like Aaron and Eva and Lisa. And mind you, I offered the job to Lisa when the in the midst of the pandemic. And I offered the job to Eva in the midst of the pandemic. And they both said yes to those that crazy offer. Um, I said yes to this job without the pandemic, even in mind. And I wonder like, would I have done it? I, I'm grateful that God has invited me into this journey, this challenging journey for Santa Clara. And it, I have confidence because of the good people I'm with. I have great hope, which is a little different than confidence, but I have great hope because of this mission that is bigger than all of us. We're going to be better. We'll be better as a country and as a campus because of our honest reckoning, but with the twin pandemics, with both. I think we'll be better if we go about it in the same way, honestly and courageously and um, generously. I think we'll be better. Wow. Thank you. Those are both really hard to follow up. Um, it's been an incredible time of growth. I think almost every day I find myself having to kind of take those 10 deep breaths, Danny, and, you know, really rely on God more than ever. I think it's really strengthened my faith because there's so much I can't control, you know, I, a bit like an engineer, I like to have my lists and my structure and control. And there's a lot that we can't have like that now. Um, so it has been a real growth year. And, you know, uh, I'm really sad for our students, you know, the fact that we couldn't have graduation in person, that we couldn't be on campus together in person for so many important moments. We couldn't welcome our first year class in person. So there's so there's been a lot of grief and loss and sadness. Um, but then I also have um, really been amazed at how how adaptive and resilient people have been, like our students. I mean, you know, many of you had never had a Zoom class before and you've really learned and you've given us good feedback that's fed into how we change things over the quarters. Our faculty has really stepped up in incredible ways. March 10th, when this all started, most of them had never taught a, a remote class. And, and so they really put in a lot of work to try to make it truly inclusive and engaging. And they went through some national training. Over 300 of them went through a, a really inclusive, diversity-focused kind of way to set up a, a remote classroom. And then um, our staff, as Eva said, all our teams across the university, you know, I really miss like not being able to be with my teams and my people. Um, but, you know, we found that maybe we can attend more of these things by Zoom. In some ways, it opens up the day, uh, you know, and, and that you can really attend more and be with people, not the same way, but in a different way. So I think that's challenged us a lot. And just how do we, um, you know, my I'm always really about peaceful conflict resolution. That's my biggest area that I teach in law, but also about building communities. So that's been a real challenge during COVID. How do we keep and strengthen and build bonds with the SCU community in, in these really strange times? So anyway, it makes me grateful for tonight. Thank you for your responses, panelists. And it's 
Yeah, it's really insightful to hear you reflect on on the past year and the things that you've had to face and kind of along those same lines, we had a question to kind of follow up on an event that happened previously this year, um, which was run by IASAC and it was their diversity forum. And so we just want to give you an opportunity to address that event. And our question is, what did you learn about the disconnect between students and admin from that IASAC forum? And how might you be working to repair that disconnect? Uh, so I think one uh, one was the the need to make sure there's effective communication um, between uh, student and there, again there's so many different student groups and um, and so many different ways of communicating that that I think it from one 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 of the things to learn was ensuring that there are effective communication channels that are not just and I've we've talked with them. Um, uh, the leaders of ISAC about this previously that so that communication is, doesn't just happen once at uh, a forum, like once a quarter, but that there's more ongoing communication. They developed a buddy system between administrators and student leaders and ISAC and others. ASG did something similar, which I thought was really, really helpful, similar to tonight about us getting, getting to know each other. Um, uh, and so I think in us to understand the different ways that students communicate, again, you know, some are, sometimes there's an email culture here, sometimes social media, and how can it be more interpersonal? Um, and again, that's all complicated with doing things remotely. So that's one of the things um, that I learned about that, um, uh, to need to communicate effectively with different channels of communication um, and appreciating different styles that people wish to communicate and can understand. And I'll just um, say that I was in a breakout room on academic issues. And it was a small uh, group, which I think facilitated conversation, it was a really robust and good conversation. Um, and so that, that was a really positive part of the forum. And then when we got to the general thing at the end, um, that was really uh, shocking and uh, just kind of stunning, uh, the incident with John Loretto and all of that. And so uh, I'm not sure exactly what you mean about the disconnect, Sarah, if there's a particular part of that um, that you want us to reflect on or anything. Um, but I know that that was really shocking, really stunned me. And then I know... It Father O'Brien had to leave the call at a set time. So it all, the end of it felt to me really uncomfortable. And I was really um, kind of sad and disturbed by that. Yeah, I, I recall um, leaving um, that call, I like, guess, is we needed more time, right? We needed more time together. Um, we needed more time to both process and discuss and have dialogue about it and, and understanding. Um, clearly, you know, I think with the um, Blue Lives Matter um, image and um, there's a disconnect there, right? And while, um, you know, the parts of the stories um, I heard of, of why that happened, you know, I, that's not to discount, you know, what people believe to be true um, with no intent to necessarily harm each other, um, but the harm happens. And um, it's, it's really important to understand why. Um, it, it's important to understand the history and it's important to try to get to um, a situation and, 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 and an opportunity to have more empathy because I don't think anybody wants to hurt anybody else if we really care about them, if we really get to know them and, and why something matters to them and or why something is hurtful. So I, I, I felt like there needs to be somehow more of those opportunities. I know that, you know, certainly in the classroom can be one place, but as a community and we're not, you know, we're not a 30,000 uh, student university, you know, we're, we're, we're a community. And I, I think that there is that opportunity for us to uh, find just a better way to, to engage and have a conversation. I know we live in a world of, you know, digital communication, but uh, I really do miss just the, um, 
the human interaction, a phone call, um, a sit down, let's have some coffee. Um, so maybe one thing that come, will come out of this pandemic is that, um, you know, having been apart for so long that we, we do that, you know. So that's what I'm hopeful about, that we can get back to really having um, authentic conversations. It sounds like a lot of the theme of, of what could what we could do about this is, is the effective communication, the empathetic communication, engaging conversation. And a follow up question I wanted to ask about that was particularly focused on the way in which the students and the university communicate with each other. Um, as you mentioned, Father O'Brien, we do have an email culture and often a lot of really important information is what is on those emails. Um, and often, you know, students feel like it can be buried, that this very important information can be buried deep in those emails. Uh, and then also the web pages as well. You know, what are some ideas about, and I know there have been ideas, what are some of the ideas about how the university can evolve, or, or not just the university as a whole, but like different groups within the university evolve and, and kind of change its communication strategy to meet the students where they are. I could just say a brief note. I think that's something I think about a lot. Uh, so, you know, I have a, a pretty active social media presence on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn, Kevin O'Brien SJ. And I basically turned over my personal accounts that I carried with me for years and said, you tried to sort of turn them over to the university, our communications office, to try to say, is this, how can we reach not just our students on campus, but alumni who communicate in this way? I think for me, the answer to the question, your question, Danny, is listening to you about your suggestions, right? So what, how, how um, and one, so one thing that came up in my, my breakout group at the diversity forum in the fall, I was um, in, um, in one group that was large, like 70 people, and we were discussing being black at SEU, as a, which is an Instagram account, I think only Instagram. And so, you know, that's one way of, a, of, of communicating. And I think what we did was we followed up to say, well, when we read or see something there, how can we follow up? If we don't know who the person is because we want to be responsive, but yet the person may find that the that they want to remain anonymous or that's the best way to sort of get their concern out. And so I think it's for, for, for us to listen to students in particular and to say, well, now, how do you, can, what's the best way? What's safe for you? How can we, and, and for me and all of us, on we all want to respond effectively, right? And, and with some you know, quickly, not you know, thoughtfully, but you know, we want to be responsive. So we need help doing that. I think so. That's we we need to listen to you, to you. Um, and I know that modes of communication change so rapidly. So what was good for a generation five seven years ago of Santa Clara students is not for incoming freshmen or first years. I just wanted to follow up a little bit about what Father O'Brien said about being black. At SCU, I know my team and I have read that those um, stories, and they're just so distressing and disturbing, um, make me really sad and angry and frustrated. And I wish uh, people would feel safe to come forward because there's such good people. You can do a, an anonymous complaint through Ethics Point. Um, or, or you could do the more official Title IX, but like we need to know if if this stuff's going on and somebody could be a repeat offender. You know, it, it, there we need to know. And and I also understand that it's really scary to uh, make a complaint about a professor or somebody in power. Um, so, they, but there are people to help you. So whether it's trusted people like Aaron, you know, through a program you're in, Ricky, maybe. Um, could be the, the dean's office, anyway, th there are people who really wanna help. And I know one way, Danny, that we tried to respond a little bit differently that we are hoping would hit students is, you know, my office was so disturbed about uh, being black at SCU Instagram 
that um, Margaret Russell, the Vice Provost for Diversity and Inclusion, and Kate Russell, the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs, wrote an article uh, for the Santa Clara newspaper. So again, just you know, another way to try to reach students in addition to the social media. But um, like Father O'Brien said, we welcome your ideas on what might be workable because we got to work together to address these concerns. Yeah, I think I'll, you know, I'll just add to, you know, I, you know, I, uh, um, to this conversation a little just from the perspective of lead, you know, we have really had to take a, I mean, it's a very kind of complicated later layered approach, you know, to our communication, um, you know, and a lot of it is, you know, getting feedback from students, um, you know, kind of working with students to figure out what's going to be most effective. Um, you know, we email out, but then the highlights of those email all go out on social media. The more complicated things, like we just, I just have to sit down in person with the students, right? So, you know, I mean, I, you know, so, you know, to be honest, like right now, I look at some of the emails that are going out and some of the website information, you know, I, I mean, like, you know, I, I get overwhelmed by what's in there, right? And trying to to break it down. Um, sometimes, you know, there's there's a, a requirement that you have to really read between the lines to understand what's being said. And so a lot of my time like is spent, you know, like, you know, you just can't explain these things over an email, right? Um, you really need to sit down with with a student and walk through their particular situation, you know, and I'm working with students who have very unique scholarship needs, very unique financial needs, you know, the money needs to come in at a certain point or, you know, you know, you know, whatever it might be, right? I need to have clarity, you know, um, about what's going on. And so I've found that, you know, just, you know, kind of what, you know, just to Eva, uh, echo Eva, right? It's like so many of these conversations need to happen in person because they are so complicated and they are so tailored to specific students' needs and situations. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm at the point, I'm texting students, right? Because they are, you know, and especially our first year students, right? It's like, you know, there's such a sense of kind of, you know, in the situation we're in, you know, to some extent disconnection, um, you know, being overwhelmed by just all of the digital interactions, right, and the screen time that I'm, you know, I'm texting them multiple times. And these are students, too. It's like they're, you know, they're, um, they have so much just going on for them, right? I have, you know, students who are working, taking care of little siblings, um, you know, who are in virtual school as well, caring for, you know, um, elders who are, who are, um, you know, um, sick right now, right? COVID and other, you know, health circumstances um, and trying to do school at the same time and navigate school virtually, you know, for the first year students, you know, um, you know, without any, you know, um, familiarity with campus um, as a physical space. Um, and so, you know, it, it really has, um, uh, you know, I, it's, you know, I, I, there's no kind of set construct, right, if, if we're going to effectively communicate. Um, and, um, yeah, and it really has to be just, you know, these different layers and, and, and meeting the students um, based on where they are and, and what their needs are. Sarah, sorry, go ahead. You can, Danny. I just wanted to thank our panelists for those thoughtful responses. And I, I just want to ask a quick impromptu follow up. Um, and I acknowledge that, you know, all of these questions that we've been asking were sent to our panelists prior. So this is a little bit of an impromptu follow up. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to ask, kind of following up on Lisa and Father Brian's comments, um, what do you think might be the reason or could you brainstorm some possible reasons why students may not currently feel comfortable coming forward through the channels that we have at Santa Clara University? So I, I know that nationally, there's a reluctance to go to Title IX officers. And I can imagine that's even more heightened now after the Trump administration's changing of the rules where the system can be more adversarial. So I know that we've tried to put some safeguards in place at Santa Clara to make it truly as supportive as it can be, but it's we still have to follow the law. So I totally get that. 
Um, again, through Ethics Point, it's a 1-800 number. There's an email. You could do an anonymous complaint. And then at least, for example, if you name the professor, the, we can actually do some investigation, right? Um, so, but, but, you know, and so uh, as Dean of the Law School, I dealt with a number of incidences where students complained of racist comments in class or a particular professor on grounds of sexual harassment or race or whatever. And, and it um, could happen in any department, any university, anywhere. And so we always took those really seriously and then leapt right in to, to make sure we addressed that right away. Because uh, you're also really trying to prevent harm to future students, right? And so, uh, I know sometimes it's a it's a big trauma to carry yourself, and and there there you know on the sexual assault side, there's now going to be a victim's advocate, and so you know, and hopefully you can find at least a trusted person who could counsel you on on the safest, most supportive way to bring it forward. But I guess I just plea to think about if if you can to bring it forward, even on behalf of other students and future students. Uh, yeah, briefly, Sarah, thanks, Lisa. I think I've, I've asked, right? So I, I don't wanna speak for students. Who, so from, I'll, I'll, I'll relate to you what I've heard from them, from some who, who have explained this the, to me. One would be not, you know, not wanting to re-traumatize, so to go through whatever incident happened again, which is understandable. Another is, um, and that's why having the supports is so important. So the support that Aaron and Eva mentioned, you know, we have a victim's advocate now, or we've, we're hiring, we've we approved a new position for a victim's advocate within student life. Um, that hopefully that might be helpful, but we have trusted mentors around campus, which may be helpful to people. The other is, um, well, nothing's going to get done anyway. So why do it, right? So a sense of frustration. And so I think that's incumbent then on, on people like Aaron and, and uh, Eva and Lisa and me, people who have authority, um, make sure that we're responsive in a timely way, that we um, are able to, we, that we act or we, or we explain why we're not acting or we're acting in a different way than, than the person would want, but that we're responsive, that we, that meaning that we're taking concrete action in response to a complaint. Some of that will be confidential, of course, given the, the law in California, but, but I think it's to, to, to say we listen, we care, we're acting. Um, and that's really important to impel, to really encourage people to, to say, yeah, no, it's worth, it's worth registering a complaint because um, they care, they'll do something. And so that, that's the hope, I hope. I think one of the challenges too, or, or what I've heard, you know, from people who, have issued complaints is that they they don't know the result of of what's happening and i'm not sure if that's maybe something that's you know going to be able to be better addressed now um, but maybe because whatever you know resolution is confidential or you know you know i've just i you know i feel like i've heard from from folks who have brought concerns to the table um, you know that that then they haven't heard what what the result um, you know, ends up being um, of some of these complaints. Um, and I think there kind of then becomes, you know, this kind of word around campus, right? About, you know, well, you know, I, I said something, but I don't even know what came of it, right? Um, and so I think there are some challenges there just in terms of, yeah, just, you know, again, going back to communication, right? Um, communicating about, you know, what, what processes are and, you know, and then when, the, you know, those processes come to some sort of conclusion, you know, ensuring that all the people who are involved are communicated with in some way. I, if I can add, I, I think what, what is ongoing and what is new is also just, um, again, the, the communication will also keep help, um, helping um, the whole community professors, staff, faculty of what, what is okay and what's not, right? What are those boundaries? Because we're talking about different gradations, right? And so um, a, a lot of those are, are microaggressions. Are, are students feeling slight or, 
you know, or, or don't perhaps in some ways feel like um, there's a reason to complain because what, you know, what do you do about it? Um, what's going to be done about it? But if we continue to have um, not just the trainings, but a very honest conversation about how we feel, how things make us feel and folks um, acknowledge and accept that that is true and understand why, well, then maybe we can all, um, you know, be better about how we um, express ourselves, how we communicate, what we do, what we don't do, and, and have a better understanding, again, what is acceptable and what's not, what's off limits in the classroom, in the way that we interact. Um, and I think that that's ongoing as well. And, and, and I'm optimistic that those, that we've reached a point where we can be a little bit more honest about, about those topics without retribution. Thank you everyone for those really thoughtful responses. And thank you again for sitting down with us and having this meaningful conversation. Unfortunately, we're coming to the end of our time for our first live section. Um, and now it's time for our panelists, 30 second closing statements. And we'd like to start please with Erin. Um, great, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I really en enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for the opportunity to um, to talk with everyone um, tonight. Um, you know, I think I just want to echo um, what was said earlier. I think Dan uh, Danny said it. You know that you know that you belong. I know that's harder to feel that right now, right? As we're all staring at each other at little screens, you know, in our homes or you know wherever we might be. Um, but you know, you you are part of this campus, right? You are part of this community. You're a valued part of this community. Right. Um, and, you know, I just want you to know that. Right. And and come to us, reach out to us. You know, uh, I saw, you know, it was really reassuring. We, you know, pivoted to an online virtual lead week um, and, you know, and our students still felt that sense of community um, with each other, with their peer mentors. Um, and so I'm hopeful. Right. That that this community, it's not the same, but we can develop a community and connection. Um, online. And so I just encourage you to, um, to reach out. Um, you know, we want to help you, you know, feel that sense of belonging, feel that sense of community. Um, and I'll drop my, um, my email in the chat if anyone wants to reach out. Um, and, you know, follow us on social media at SCU Lead Scholars um, on Instagram and LinkedIn. Um, and we still do Facebook uh, for those of you who are old school. So uh, we'd love to um, connect with you um, in any way that we can. Thank you, Erin. And now we'd like to move on to Eva's closing statement. Well, thanks again for, for having me. Um, you know, I really can't wait to get back on campus and be able to see all of you um, and, and be a part of, of, of campus life. Um, you know, along the lines of, I, I wanna echo what Erin mentioned, mentioned you absolutely do belong. And I can say that with authority. Admissions accepted you. You belong here. You have you have so much to offer. And, and, and this, um, you know, again, I, I truly believe that uh, um, with everything that comes, good, bad, there is a good outcome. And so, um, you know, the contributions that you bring, um, share them, um, contribute them. Uh, to, to those who you're close with, to, to others who you may not have met before, but that is the opportunity now that we learn from each other. It's not just, again, the, the, the textbook and the lectures. It's about each other. And I think that that is the promise, is the human connection and that opportunity. So um, I, I truly believe that. Um, and, and I've seen it. I, I've seen it generation. Again, remember, I've been here for 18 years. There's some of the graduates who've now come back with their kids and their families and they're thriving and they're doing great. And yes, they still carry with them, you know, again, what, what uh, the, the mission and the drive and the, the, the purposefulness that I think, um, you know, really cements here at Santa Clara University. You carry that for life. Um, so um, know that we are here to support you. Um, I know sometimes that doesn't always feel that way, but but know that we want you to be successful and we want you to feel good and we want you to go back out to the world and set it on fire. Um, and so, you know, with that, um, thank you for having me and just know that uh, you have um, a, a, a resource 
in, in me. Um, and I will say that the that goes to the extension of of my staff and enrollment management. Um, you know, I work with some incredible people who who have similar um, um, and very you know purposeful reasons for doing the work that they do, and it all connects back to to um, their experiences and getting to know and connect you all. Um, that is our reward: is getting to bring you onto campus and watch you graduate and thrive. So thank you all for all you do and thanks for having me on, the, on this program. Thanks, Eva. Next, Father Kevin O'Brien. Yeah, so, you know, as a Catholic priest, I don't have my own uh, children, uh, but I think part of the gift of, of my work here and elsewhere has been that the students I've come to know, um, you know, I care deeply about as, uh, as young men and women, sons and daughters entrusted to me for a time. And that's why I take my care of each of you so, um, so much to heart. Uh, and, you know, given the, the theme that you've been at for this year, um, you know, I think a lot about diversity and often we can think of it as, some can think of it as a requirement, but for me, it's a gift. And more to the point for me as a Jesuit, it's an expression of God's creativity that we are all the better for honoring. So um, we're better because of you, because of the diversity that Santa Clara brings and uh, that we need to honor. So thanks everyone. Thank you. And last, Lisa Klappenberg. Thank you very much, Danny. Um, again, just thanks to all the student organizers, Director Padilla for this whole series. It's so important to have mentors and role models and to see what's possible in the near future. And, and I think that's this series has really made that possible. Um, and then I wanted to say thank you, as Father O'Brien said, each of you is a gift and you make us better. You make our whole community better by being here. So please, you know, be yourself and share the gift of yourself with all of us. And finally, I just wanted to say, you know, take care of yourselves. Last week was really crazy. Not an easy week to the start of the term and all. And then next week, I'm so excited. What a historic day. We're going to have our first female uh, vice president, right? And a BIPOC vice president. I mean, it's amazing. Um, so, you know, there's reasons to celebrate, but also scary stuff going on in the world. So do take care of yourself, take care of each other and know that you're in our hearts and our prayers. Thank you everyone for your closing statement. Um, we wanted to quickly thank our panelists for making time today from their busy schedules to join us. And we wanted to especially thank them for sharing their stories and helping us further this conversation on such important issues during a critical time in our history and helping us move our SU community forward in a positive direction. Yeah, and to all of our previous panelists and moderators, we wanna send you a special thank you. Um, without, the panel, without you, the panel would not have been possible. And I wanna thank the School of Engineering, the Ideas Coalition, which is made up of SHIP, Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, SWE, the Society of Women Engineers, NESVI, the National Society of Black Engineers, ACMW, Association of Computing Machiner Machinery Women's Chapter, and then Women in STEM. <laughs> I'm sorry for running through all those so quickly. Uh, each of you deserve a lot more uh, time, but your various perspectives, wisdom, and advice helped us build up to today. And you know, thank you to every student, faculty, and staff from SU and everyone across the world for tuning in. This event has been recorded and will be posted up soon on our website at www.scu edu slash engineering slash WTWT. <laughs> Want to make sure you get it right just so you don't miss it. Thank you, everybody. And just as a reminder to all of our SEU students on the call, if you're interested in speaking more with our panelists, remember to join us on Zoom shortly after this portion of the event for the special talk after the walk event with our panelists. This Zoom link was shared with you in your SEU email this morning by Ricardo Padi Jr. Um, and to the, all the SCU community and general public watching our live stream, we hope you leave here today with more tools to turn on your thoughts, your words into meaningful action to build up our community. So to everybody, please be on the lookout for season two of the Walking the Walk Together in the future. 
happy 2021 to everyone. And I hope you all have a good night.